another anthropology lecture. This time we're going to focus on the names of Pharaoh. I should really say king at this point since Pharaoh is not a common term um, in early Egyptian history. Really we don't see Pharaoh or Pera, the, the, the great house, being referred to the king of Egypt until much later um, consistently. Um, but it's the word everybody assumes for king of Egypt, so we're going to use it here. And we're going to look at what naming conventions were used to identify the king of Egypt. And we're going to think about names as indicators of power, indicators of status, indicators of religion as well um, when we get to towards the end of the lecture. Um, so this is lecture 10 for anthropology, and I would invite you after finishing this lecture to think about your own name. What does it mean? What were the choices open to your parents? Um, what kind of cultural inheritance does your name carry? Do you have a nickname? Are there other ways we could refer to you, other titles that we could give to you um, that might signify something about your status and your identity. So come along with me for the names of the king. So as we get started, um, we're going to do a little bit of chronology so we can get ourselves situated in time. A lot of what we talked about so far um, in the class has been focused on dynasties one and two. So Narmer forward, um, a period in which we saw the unification of the state which was more a process than an actual event. Um, the development of the, the ideology of kingship and really a set of ideas surrounding the king to describe the king's power and nature. Um, dynasties three through six, which will take us from 2686 BCE to 2181 BCE, are known as the Old Kingdom of Egypt um, and this is a period of Egyptian history which is associated with pyramids, largely. Um, this is the great age of pyramid building. You know, we've moved from building in the desert, in holes in the ground that we've lined with mud bricks and maybe covered with a mound, to actually building magnificent stone constructions that reach to the heavens. Uh, and we'll be taking a look at those pyramids. Um, this is really when the, the Egyptian state becomes fully realized, though I would be, you know, a poor scholar if I didn't point out that there are limits. Um, we often think of the Egyptian state as all-powerful, but no state is all-powerful. States cannot control everything. Um, so we will keep that in mind just a little bit. Um, the artistic canons, and I don't mean like canons, like canons, I mean the traditions and the rules, like when you tell somebody, well, that's not canon, that means that's not part of the original story. Um, for the ancient Egyptians on the Old Kingdom is where we solidify many of the images and the styles and the expectations that we come to associate with ancient Egypt even though we saw elements of those before the Old Kingdom. Um, there's a series of pyramid texts written in this time period. We're going to read uh, probably the most famous of them, but also the, probably the most hard to understand, um, uh, the so-called cannibal hymn. These are funerary texts um, that are important to the Egyptians and uh, important to the ideology of kingship. Now on to the names. And I like to think of these names as reinforcements of divinity. You know, the idea of Pharaoh being the divine representation of, Os of uh, Horus on earth and Osiris in death. Um, you see that divinity reinforced in these names. Um, but it's not always, of course, Osiris or Horus. Um, we will see other divinities referred to, other gods called upon um, to reinforce the power and the status of the pharaoh, the king. But 
Probably the top, the preeminent deity that's always going to be invoked is Horus. Um, the primary name of the king will be the Horus name. And we see that even before there is a dynastic order in the pre-dynastic period. Associations of, of, this, of powerful leaders with Horus, like for example, Irihor. Um, there is a new name that starts appearing, the Nesutbiti name, uh, which you will see referred to as the he of the sedge and the bee or the Lord of the Two Lands, um, that appears in the First Dynasty. Um, one scholar has said that really, we shouldn't think of this as the embodiment of the Two Lands, King of Upper and Lower Egypt, but we should think of this as like a dualness. Uh, the, he's the dual king, the king of, of all, both. Um, and there's a lot of duality in, in ancient Egypt not just the two lands, north and south, not just the um, Kemet black around the river and versus Deshret around in the, the desert and the hills beyond. Um, this duality uh, between like the world that's here and now on earth and then the world and hereafter, um, that appears a lot in Egyptian culture. Um, and so Toby Wilkinson says we should think of this as like dual king more than we should think of it as a literal reference to the two lands. Um, but you'll see this a lot. He of the sedge and the bee uh, will be probably the most common thing you'll read uh, if you're reading books about this. Um, the Nebti name or the two ladies name. Hey, ladies. Um, what two ladies are we talking about here? Um, this these are two goddesses. So see what I said about association of the king with deities? The goddesses Nekbet and Wajit. Um, Nekbet is associated with Upper Egypt. Um, this is a vulture goddess who spreads her wings and protects. And you often see images of Nekbet uh, protecting with her wings. Um, fierce goddess, so not just a protectress. And then Wajet, the cobra goddess um, from Lower Egypt. So this also is a hint to duality, north and south, two goddesses. But I think more important is, you know, we're once again linking not to just Horus, but some other deities who protect um, and surround the king with protection. Now, there's an interesting name that appears um, in the first dynasty known as the Golden Horus name. Um, and it's sort of like, you weren't Horus enough. We gotta be extra horus -y. It's sort of like an amplified Horus. Um, so you will see this um, when I show you some um, names of different kings. Um, we can't get enough of Horus. Um, so once again, invoking the power of this falcon-headed god. And then the birth name or the nomen. Nomen's just a fancy Latin term for name. Um, so if you're in Latin or if you're like me, you have a degree in Latin, uh, it's just name. That's all it means. Um, one of the things that we will see um, very early on is this nomen being attached to the phrase son of Ray. Um, but you don't see it clearly very early on until we get until uh, about the fifth dynasty, the fourth and the fifth dynasty, and Ray becomes very prominent. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the lecture. So I wanna say, just because there are five names here doesn't mean that every king of Egypt will have all five. In fact, it's not kind of standard to see all five in use until about the 11th or 12th dynasty. Um, and you see these and variations of these um, over and over um, because the Egyptians, it's not like they sat down and decided we're gonna be completely um, consistent 
in how we refer to the king. It's the king. He can refer to himself any dang way he wants to. Um, so you will find multiple variants of some of these names. Some of these names, when we look at them, it's kind of hard to interpret what they mean, and scholars go back and forth and try to figure out, okay, these signs, what do they actually say, and what's this a reference to? Um, so keep in mind that just because we have five names doesn't mean you'll see them all the time, um, and it doesn't mean that there are only five names. I mean, he's a king. He can change his name as often as he wants, and we actually do see that even early on um, in Egyptian history. So I'm going to show you uh, three titularies. Oh, that sounds like a fun word. Three sets of titles. That's what titulary means. Um, and I'm going to start first with Sneferu of Dynasty Four. Um, there is Sneferu's name. But you could see him um, with his Horus name. How do we know it's his Horus name? This is the Horus falcon here. And this is Neb Mayot, Lord of Mayot, Possessor of Mayot, Mayot being order, um, if you remember from earlier in the course. So this would be Sneferu Neb Mayot. Then we would get the two ladies' name. How do we know it's two ladies? Well, we got them. The two ladies will show up, um, and they are Nekbet, Vulture, Wajit, Cobra. And look, it's the same name. These are the same hieroglyphs here. So this is uh, the two ladies' Lord of Mayot, Lord of Order. The Golden Horus. How do we know it's a Golden Horus? This is what you will see. So once again, it's the Horus Falcon. Um, and the, the name for Sneferu, his Golden Horus name, um, Biknepu, um, just means the Golden Falcon. And then last, not least, the name that we refer to him as um, in all the books, um, Sneferu or you sometimes see Snoferu or Snefru. Um, the fun thing about Egyptian kings is that we get Greek versions of their names and we get readings of their names by early Egyptologists. And then of course we have more modern Egyptologists telling us what they think the name really actually means. Um, so this, by the way, S, this is the sign for Nefer, which is beautiful or perfect. Um, Eferu, ooh sound, the quail chick, ooh. Let's do another one. This time we're going to do Khufu, um, who is famous as the builder of the Great Pyramid, though he actually didn't build it himself people built that thing for him. Khufu's name is represented here. Um, so you can see the, the ooh sign, the F, the horned serpent here, so Khufu. His Horus name, once again the Horus Falcon, is Horus who has been followed, Mejadu. A golden Horus name of Bikui Nebu. Look how Horus he is. He is double Horus, double golden falcon. So it's not just Bik Nebu, it's Bikui Nebu. His Nebti name, or the two ladies' name. Hey, ladies. Um, this is um, he who has adhered to the two ladies. So um, we've got the same here, Mejadu, referred to. Mejed, and then the two uh, ladies there, Nekbet and Wajit. And then the throne name, Khufu. Notice that it's reversed from this um, reading over here. So we have Khufu here, and then it's flipped here. 
Um, and that's because the rule in hieroglyphs is that you find what direction the animals are facing or the people and you read from that direction. So these quail chicks are looking this way, which means we read from the direction they face. This quail chick and this little horned viper are looking this way, so we reverse it. Put a thing down, flip it, and reverse it. Uh, let's do one more titulary. Um, we're going to do Pepi II of the Sixth Dynasty, whom I really am fascinated by because he comes to the throne at a very young age. Um, and we have this famous set of instructions about him bringing, um, him getting a pygmy from far south in Africa. So this little person is going to be brought to him and Pepi writes about how the his uh, people should take care of this little person, make sure he doesn't fall out of the ship. He's got to be protected because it will delight majesty's heart to be entertained by this little person. Um, so we might deal with that a little bit later. Um, but for now, let's take a look at his titulary. Um, his horse name, Necher Kao, so falcon. Um, if you ever see this hieroglyph here, um, this Necher is um, for divinity, God. Um, it's thought that the ancient Egyptians in their shrines or temples or places of worship might have had banners. And so this banner uh, represented divinity because it was associated with um, a place of worship. That is um, the golden horse name. So Bik Nebu Sekhem. Um, the powerful golden falcon. So we've got golden falcon and another sign here. Um, so he's not just a double golden falcon like um, we just saw a few minutes ago. This is a powerful falcon, golden falcon. Um, his two ladies' name, notice it's Necher Kao, again, with the two ladies. This is the divine one of appearances of the two ladies. So Horus, divine of appearances, um, the two ladies, divine one of appearances. Um, ah, look, we've got a new name that we haven't seen for, before. Um, this is the throne name, um, Nefer, Nefer Ka Re. So the perfect one of the Ka of Re, the complete one, the beautiful one of the Ka of Re. So this is Nefer and this is Ka Re here. Um, and then finally, his actual name, Pepi, uh, which is just a cute little name. Um, very short name. And he's the second of them. So uh, we might spend some time on the Pepis a little bit later. This would have been his birth name. So I hope you can see that in early Egyptian history, um, these names do appear with some regularity, but don't expect them to be all there. Um, sometimes we see six names invoked. Sometimes people, kings change their names. Um, sometimes you see them combined here. So this is beautiful or perfect is the Ka of Re, Pepi. So um, this throne name and his birth name combined in the same um, image here. So one of the things um, that you may have noticed in Pepe's name is that there was a mention of another deity, Re. Um, beautiful is the Ka of Re. Um, and that's because in the Old Kingdom, um, the worship of the sun god Ray becomes prominent, especially by the fifth dynasty. And you start to see the name of Ray pop up um, quite frequently in the royal titulary. Um, Ray is obviously a god that we've not talked about before, but it's an inescapable fact that Egypt is hot. I mean, yes, there's the Nile, and yes, we've got falcons, and yes, there are cobras, 
um, and vultures. But you look up and there's definitely going to be a sun there. Um, so the sun god becomes important, even though, I mean, it's inescapable that the, there's going to be sun in Egypt. And obviously that's going to inspire um, some kind of musing on the nature of the sun, even before the fifth dynasty. The thing that's interesting about the Egyptians and Ray is that they don't mind him melding with other gods. And in fact, it's the nature of divinity in ancient Egypt that identities kind of like flow in and out. And the essence of the gods are not, they're not limited to specific duties. It's not as if Ray can only just do one thing. Um, his divinity can take on and be associated with other divinities. Um, and Ray gets associated with Horus as Ray Horakti. Ray is the Horus of the horizon, which kind of makes sense. You look up in ancient Egypt to see a falcon, what else are you going to see? Well, you're going to see that falcon flying against the backdrop of the sun. It's not like there are any clouds to like block the view. And Ray also gets associated with Atum. Remember Atum, the creator god arising on the primeval mound of creation, um, creating Shu, um, Tefnut, and all the others. The association with Ray and Atum, Ray Atum or Atum Ray, then links the sun god to the creator god. Um, which after all, we've got primeval waters, the mound emerging, it's Egypt, what else are you gonna look up and see but the sun? Sun had to be there too. Um, the primary center of worship for this sun um, deity is Heliopolis. Um, it's a Greek name. So Helios and Polis, Greek words for city of the sun. Um, in Egyptian, that's something like you knew, uh, though we're not exactly sure that that's really what it sounded like, on or you knew, something like that. Um, but what we will notice is the increasing association of the king with Re as Sa Re. So not only is the king the living embodiment of Horus, but he is also the son of the sun god. And this is what you will see in hieroglyphs for that. A duck. I know. Does it look like a duck? Kind of. And then the circle with the circle. Sa Re, son of the sun god. And here is our sun god himself. Wait, what? He's a falcon, Re Horakti. But we see the sun above here, the, the image of the sun. We even have a Uraeus, remember that? Um, the cobra, the spitting cobra that protects. And we see it repeated here, the falcon wearing um, the sun god with a tiny little Uraeus on top as well. So get used to seeing this a lot with the king. Um, and then also get used to it changing because we will encounter two more changes in religion that are pretty big. So just wait till we get to Amun and the Aten. Finally, one last note on how we signify this kingship. I've already mentioned in a reading that pre-dynastic period through about the third dynasty, we see a serek, which is an image of the palace walls. So you see a square with lines, and that's supposed to represent the palace, which is, of course, a direct reference to the king, um, surmounted by the falcon god Horus and sometimes by the god Set as well. So, for example, this is Jet. King Cobra, Horus Cobra, and you can see the palace walls here um, in the Sarek. But there will be an innovation that will appear um, right at the end of the third dynasty um, and really taking off in the fourth, and that is the cartouche. Cartouche is not an Egyptian word. Um, 
it's French. Um, when the French were in Egypt in um, the 1790s, looking at all of these um, kings' names in a circle, they thought the circles kind of looked like bullet cartridges. And so that's how the name cartouche came about. But in Egyptian, it's shen. Um, it just means to encircle. Um, and it's got a sort of association with eternity to it. Um, it's a never ending circle, right? So it's eternity. Um, and to put the king's name in this shen um, is to associate the king with eternal things, right? He is eternally protected. You even see Horus and Nekbet um, holding a shen. Horus sometimes is a falcon grasping the symbol of the shen um, in his claws. So here is a cartouche, um, and this is the cartouche of Unas. So this um, desert hare, Unas. Um, so this E, E, E sound, and then an S sound. Um, we will talk about him because there is a famous pyramid text to him called the Cannibal Hymn. So get ready for the king to eat some people and gods. That has been our look at the Egyptian royal titulary and uh, the ways in which divinity is associated with the king and the power of names in ancient Egypt. So I invite you now to think about your own name. Maybe you want to take a throne name or a, a two ladies name. It's up to you. See you next time.